Welcome to today's Politics and Tactics. We have a great show for you today. Yesterday's New York State Supreme Court issued a stern rebuke on the city of New York's vaccine mandates, scoring a hat trick, adding to the victories of firefighter Timothy Reverdy and a New York City police officer. Firefighter Ravici was ordered to be reinstated due to a religious exemption. And in the case of a city police officer, the court ruled in the officer's favor concerning the city's obligation to collectively bargain conditions of employment for incumbent personnel. Yesterday's state Supreme Court ordered the reinstatement of New York City sanitation workers with back pay. However, this requires to be parsed out. The New York State Supreme Court is not the highest court in New York. This order, as of this morning, is being ignored by the city as they prepare to appeal. It is my understanding that the same is true with the other two cases. This ruling is not the end of the fight, and sticking with the hockey metaphor, we're at the end of the first period. And New York is not the only battleground. Like a vice of bad public policy, the East Coast and West Coast is squeezing the nation, failing to change even when the political lies are exposed and the scientific consensus changes. Equally disturbing, most mandates were not instituted with legislative approval. They were instituted by the executive branch, ruling by edict, with information that was kept from public scrutiny. In the words of the great American philosopher, John Mayer, if you control the information, you can bend it all you want. Today, we're gonna to talk to an FDNY battalion chief forced into retirement and a Seattle firefighter wrongly terminated. Yesterday's ruling in Garvey v. New York City Department of Health should have important implications on other city workers, including the fire department. However, the reasoning in that court order makes a distinction that sanitation workers are not healthcare workers. While other parts of the order build on the other cases, citing that mandates were arbitrary and capricious, violated separation of powers, and treated similar situated employees by the same administrative body differently this should help workers across the country. I have long said that the two most dangerous halls in America is the one that's on fire when you have no line attempting to reach the room of origin to close the door to contain the fire, facilitating a clean stretch for the engine company. We know they need the help. The other hall, City Hall, won't just endanger your life, but can take your livelihood. And both of our guests have had the courage to fight in both halls. People often refer to David and Goliath as the uphill fight against insurmountable odds, forgetting that David won, forgetting that in America, the determined individual, when truth is on their side, can overcome anything. Unfortunately, taking on a fight has its cost, a cost to the individual and a cost to their families. Our guests are both great men, willing to pay the cost, willing to lead where many of our other leaders have faltered. It is a high honor to have them on the show. With that, I will pass to Bobby Halton, and then I will have PJ introduce our great guests. As always, I put forth the declaimer that Chief PJ Norwood is the director of the Connecticut Fire Academy and the opinions expressed on this show are not the opinions of the Connecticut Fire Academy or the Lamont administration. Uh, PJ is a regular host of this show and I and Bobby Halton choose the topics. So um, <laughs> it is what it is. Uh, with no further ado, the editor in chief of Fire Engineering, it's an honor to have you on the show, Bobby Halton. Uh, take it away. Well, I, <clears throat> I, I think you put it very well, Frank. This is a incredibly complex problem. And I think that the um, public needs to reflect on what happened. And one of the hallmarks I think of character is when someone can admit that perhaps they made a mistake. And I think that some individuals, and I have friends on the left and I have friends on the right, 
And my friends on the left would say that given the information they had at the time, they thought these were the best actions to take, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. My friends on the right would say it was a gross overreach of uh, administrative authority. It was an experimental uh, uh, treatment. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm loath to call it a vaccine because like the meme on the internet, if you had your dog vaccinated three times against rabies and you still got rabies, you'd get your money back. So the, the problem is, is that now the evidence is mounting that there are substantial risks. There are obvious religious problems with it. I'm a uh, I, my, my religious beliefs make it impossible for me to comply. And then there's also the, 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 the compulsion factor just out of conscious alone and, 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 and scientific evidence that was not there. So some of the assumptions early on obviously were highly flawed. There was bad math coming out of England and we all know that now. Um, and, and that notwithstanding, the correction needs to be made. I believe personally, that every single person, irrespective of if they were fire or police or hospital workers or school teachers who were fired due to this mandate should be, should be reinstated immediately, reinstated immediately um, and, and fully compensated to the best of uh, ability possible by those entities that let them go. I think it was a, a gross miscarriage of justice. And so I do speak for myself. I have the editor's opinion. My whole life I was told to keep my opinion to myself and now I get paid to have one. So that is my opinion. It has been my opinion throughout this entire ordeal. Um, you know, I don't think anyone should be compulsed to take any experimental medicine or any medicine um, uh, unless there's an absolute ironclad case for it and it does not put that individual at risk. And even then, I respect the, my friends that are, um, I believe they're called Seventh-day Adventists or uh, Christian scientists who refuse to take any medicine whatsoever. That's their choice. This country was founded on freedom of religion. This country was founded on freedom of choice. So, you know, to, to impose on the individual in, in order to protect the collective, that's not a philosophy that our founding fathers bore in their hearts whatsoever. Now, do we try to do the most good? Yeah, but the individual rights always come first, always. So with that, I too, I'm extremely proud of Tom and Steve for taking a stand, but it came at a tremendous cost. And, and two, two, two gentlemen who I happen to know are, are extremely well regarded in their organizations. I have friends in Seattle. I have friends in New York City who couldn't speak more highly of the both of you. And uh, Chief, uh, Captain Dugan sends his good regards, Tom. He said that there's... There's probably nobody better in corduroy and blue jeans than you. Oh, and I think that's, uh, that's high praise from Captain Dugan, for sure. A good man. Yeah, good man. And so without any further ado, I'll let our uh, hosts, PJ and, and Frank, take over. But uh, I fully support the reinstatement of every firefighter, every law enforcement officer, every school teacher, every nurse, every physician, I personally wrote a letter for my doctor uh, for his religious exemptions. My, my oncologist for my, the guy who was treating my cancer was being forced to take that. He did not, he's still employed, but he's still fighting with them. And now they want him to take a flu shot. So I had to write another note for him to, to, to not have to take a flu shot. And the man's a devout Christian and he's got religious concerns about those uh, shots. So anyway, um, it, it's not just us who've been victimized by this ideology. And, and trust me, right now, it's just an ideology because the science is in and, and it's not supporting this whatsoever. Agreed. Thanks, Chief. So uh, I get the absolute honor to uh, introduce these two amazing guests today. But before I do that, Frank, I didn't uh, warn you of this, but uh, I just felt it was important, even though it was a uh, fire service related show, um, that we just uh, take a moment to think of the Bristol, Connecticut police officers that were killed in the line of duty uh, two weeks ago. Uh, this past week, we buried Officer Alex Hamsey and Officer um, Dustin, Sergeant Dustin DeMonte, who were both uh, ambushed and uh, killed in the line of duty. Uh, but also to honor the bravery of Officer Alec Arito who was a, the newest police officer who showed up third, 
who was also wounded. And after being wounded with one single shot, was able to take out one of those that killed the first two police officers arriving. So our thoughts and prayers are with uh, not all, only the Bristol Connecticut Police Department, but the fire department who was impacted, the EMS agency of Bristol that was impacted by this incident, um, especially the families. Uh, this is the week after the funeral. So this is a, a very difficult week for them as a lot of that uh, attention and assist and help that they had around them uh, immediately following uh, is starting to probably wane a little bit. So just appreciate you thinking of those, uh, those two officers and, and their families. Uh, now to move forward with these, uh, these amazing guests, I'm going to start with, the, with uh, FDNY Battalion Chief Tom LaPola. Uh, the chief joined the FDNY in 84. He began his, uh, his career in Red Hook, Brooklyn on engine 279 and up as Battalion Chief uh, in the 8th Battalion, which Chief, don't worry, we called everybody in the 9th Battalion, so we won't tell them. Uh, but the 8th Battalion is considered the high-rise capital of the world. Uh, the chief was uh, lead instructor at FDNY's uh, Chief's Command Course and High Rise Program. He was FDNY representative for the New York City Building Code and Techo Committee for Elevators and Escalators. Uh, he was involved in the FDNY Elevator Project uh, as the review coordinator for the Fire Prevention Program. He retired, unfortunately, in 2022, or fortunately, depending on uh, what day of the week it is and what fight he's fighting on that day. He's been published in Fire Engineering, um, and since his retirement, um, he's been really working and fighting uh, against the vaccine mandates. He's been actively engaged in the efforts to rescind the policies that have impacted many FDNY firefighters, uh, most recently working with the Bravest for Choice and most recently with the National Coalition of Frontline Workers. So, Chief, uh, thank you for joining us, and uh, we'll, we'll get to you in a second after we introduce uh, Steve there. Steve informed us he's working on uh, getting prepared for Christmas. Um, but prior to, prior to that, he's a 25-year a uh, U.S. Army uh, helicopter pilot with multiple deployments in, in Iraq from, 2000, uh, from 2003 to 2005. Uh, he's a retired Seattle firefighter. He was a, a ladder truck driver where he spent 15 years of his career. He's a husband and father, four married uh, children, also has some grandchildren. He's currently a business owner importing cars. Uh, Steve, thank you not only for your service in Seattle, uh, but also for your service overseas, fighting for my family's freedom. Uh, without people like you, I wouldn't even have the ability to stand here and talk to you today or talk to the, the fire service community. So really thank you for your, for your service for, for my freedoms. Um, so as you can see, we have two amazing, uh, more than qualified individuals to talk about this uh, potentially, or not potentially, it's a controversial topic. And I, I appreciate the way uh, Frank and Chief Fulton has set this up, and I'm interested to learn from, uh, from all of you a little bit today. Frank? Thanks, PJ. Uh, we're going to start with Tom, and Chief kind of let you tell your, your story. Um, one of the issues that I see, and as Bobby said, if we, if we give credit to those who are our friends on the left who say, you know, this was the information we had and we made the best possible decisions. The issue is, and Bobby has talked extensively in the fire service, how you have to make almost perfect decisions based off imperfect information. But in the fire service, we know as we get more information, we change and adapt. And as the information came in that, yeah, you can get vaccinated and you're still spreading it. We're not, this isn't a firewall against uh, the spread of this virus, um, the politicians attach too much of their ego to it that they couldn't separate the ego from the position. And they're still headstrong on, on enforcing these mandates. Out of the nation's 50 top largest cities, we have 13 of those cities that have full out mandates. So, so Tom, uh, kind of introduce your side of the story in New York City. First of all, thank you for the opportunity to everyone here. And, and I'm going to echo PJ's uh, words regarding Steve. Thank you, Steve, for your, uh, your dedication to, the, to this great country. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. And thank you, Chief Alton. I remember meeting you a few years back and you gave a great speech on, on leadership. And it's still, uh, it's still something that I, I keep deep inside me. You're a great role model. Appreciate it. And Frank, thank you. And thank you, everyone here. Um, and I forgot. I, it's not the first time I've done it. I forgot to include my wife in my bio. I have a wife and three children and a couple of grandchildren. I hope she's out, so we're good. Um, yeah, my story, uh, I understood that there, would, there was some discussion about the, the, the mandates coming. We really weren't sure, uh, were we gonna be forced? And I already decided I wasn't taking it. And initially it was specifically my religious understanding of the connection to aborted B 
fetal fetal cells, and that was it. I wasn't getting it. But I'm, and I, I was never opposed to vaccines per se. I would get the flu shot every year. I got the flu one year. It knocked the sh. Can I say shit? It knocked the shit out of me. Excuse me. I, it, 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 and I said I got the flu shot every year. I'm not opposed to the vaccine. I was opposed to the forced coercion of it. And then I recognized this vaccine doesn't even work. And, and, and to Bobby's point, it's not a vaccine. It's, an ex, it's still experimental. It's still a gene therapy. And they still don't have the long-term effects on it. So you take out that safe and effective term, that's done. If it was safe and effective at 95%, which they said in the beginning, these mandates never would have occurred. You wouldn't have needed to. Everybody would have gotten the shot. Once people realized how unhealthy they were, the long-term effects hadn't been um, decided yet. They still haven't gotten a, a full understanding of it. So with that said, I did retire, but I, I, I do tell people I really didn't retire. I was fired. I was fired. I, I had 1,500 hours of comp time that I had accrued. I'd worked for the city, working, teaching at the fire academy and working directly with other municipal agencies. And then I uh, wanted to take a month at a time and just take my time and see how the, the mandate played out. Unfortunately, I was told if you want to take the time that you've earned, you have to retire. So in, in private industry, like my wife worked in private industry, to me, that's you're terminated, you're fired. So yeah, I was blessed. I have my pension and I was very well blessed with that. My pension is solid, but I'm not here again for myself. There are men and women that are still on leave without pay. There are men and women that have been terminated that do not have the financial blessings that I have. These people stood their ground. They were people, men and women of conviction. And they understood that if they, if they were forced and coerced, like the city was looking to do, that they would really do more damage, not only to themselves physically, but to the, to the department, to their families and to the nation. They understood that the difficulties of taking this shot. And, and they're the true heroes right now. The people that have been fired, and there's many of them, and the people that want to leave without pay for a year. I'm talking to people regularly. People can't bury their loved ones. People are going into um, foreclosure. They're, 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 that's just a, a few people. It's, and this is just specific to New York City. And I'm sure Steve has similar stories out in Seattle too. And this, this was not health science by any means of the imagination. This is political science. The, 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 I, I, I start to recognize, and I can say it right now, that Mayor Adams and, and the, obviously the, the mayor before that are spiteful and petty people. They cannot recognize the errors of their ways. If Mr. Adams recognized it from the beginning of his um, administration, recognizing that I didn't implement this, I'm going to cancel these draconian edicts, not, not through the legislative process. He would have been a hero, but he decided to, to double down. And, and unfortunately, it's had a great impact on the individuals. And I'll leave you to this. And, I go, and I'll let you go, Frank. Is, um, it's impacted the, the, the agency itself. It's impacted the agency itself. Men and women still on the fire department, they don't have the staffing. They don't have the staffing. And in regards to Tim Ravici's story, I was so ecstatic when he won his job back. I figured he'd be back in the firehouse almost immediately. And it was sad to find out yesterday following the other story, the other good news story, that the city of New York, and I'm not even going to say the city, this time it's the fire department of New York who's actually making that fight. And when it comes to leadership, I know there's civilians that are making these decisions, but at some point, I want to see the chiefs, the leaders of this department, stand up for their men. Tim Rivici is a young fireman who deserves to be fought for, and not necessarily by retired members like, like myself. No, no, I, I'll do the best I can and help them, but it's men in uniform, the, the leaders of this department right now, that actually have the ear of that commissioner. They're the ones that are going to actually can force the fire department of New York to say, you know what, we need the staffing, we need the men. And it's the best thing for this department. And at the same time, we'll take care of the men and women that took care of the city during the, during the pandemic. Tom, that's very well said. And, you know, I, you also hit upon the experience thing. And I talk to elected leaders all over the country about negotiations. And one of the things I always stress is that when you're, you can't just view public safety as through financial constraints, you can't put forth a policy where you're going to lose a quarter of your command staff. You just can't replace that experience that quick. So the fire departments are suffering and it does, it's just bad public policy. 
I'm going to go to Bobby and then we'll go to Steve and, and we're going to go back and forth, uh, Tom. So we're going to be hearing more from you, Bobby. And to, Tom, <clears throat> to Tom's point, oftentimes some of our leadership has concerns with their employment. And so they're protecting their jobs. Um, I often tell folks, don't, don't put on multiple trumpets unless you're prepared to walk away. You know, I, we ought, to, we ought to reserve, I, I would say, battalion and above level jobs for people that have the pension in the bag, because every now and then you just got to stand for your principles and, and, and walk away and, you know, stand for your people's principles as well. And so I, I, I have friends, Jack's a friend of mine, you know, in the utmost highest levels of the FDMY, I have nothing but the utmost respect for him. And, and I'm sure that he's, I hope that he's doing everything he can uh, to get these men and women back to the jobs that they deserve to be at. And full disclosure, my sister Elizabeth was working at Sloan Kettering. She was forced to retire. She was an oncology nurse there. She was a nurse practitioner. She was the, you know, she was one of the best of the best with 40 years of experience, was not ready to retire. She was forced to retire. And, uh, she was, just like just like Steve and, and Tom, they were good enough to serve during the height of the pandemic, uh, unvaccinated, uh, and then after the obviously the the, it, the the emergency's over. But to Tom's point, right now it's political power, and they're holding on to these mandates, these emergency powers. I would hope that our politicians, if they ever get to listen to this, and I don't know, you know, Frank does. I think one of the movements that needs to happen statewide and and nationally is to define what a national emergency is, because this clearly was not. And <clears throat> if we're being attacked and bombs are dropping, I'm good with emergency powers. But a virus, I'm not. I mean, that's where the individual gets to choose what level of risk they want to expose themselves to, period. Period. Hard stop. It, it, that is not a government function. And so I think that's one of the things that you know, our IAFF, and I did contact the IAFF, invited them to join with us on today's call. They were unable due to some um, activity they're involved in today. They're, so, which, is, which was legit. No, Frank, it was legit. They're, 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 they're involved in a, a process. So the two people that could speak to it uh, were, were not available. So um, they have agreed to speak with us uh, at a later date. And I'll invite Steve and Tom and Frank, PJ, to join me in that conversation with them. Because I think the IAFF also represents about 300,000 men and women. Of that 300,000, men in Seattle, men in, and women in New York, men and women in LA were unjustly fired, unjustly fired. And they deserve representation. And, and I'm uh, hoping President Kelly will come on and say that that, that is being afforded to those men and women um, you know, forthwith. But I, I think that to Tom's point, it, it was... Uh, it, 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 it was absolutely unconscionable. You know, it's one thing for, for men in, in, in our position, you know, enough years to walk away. Uh, but the young men and women who lost their jobs, and I know several in Seattle who did not have their pensions. I know several in FDNY who did not have their pensions in their pockets. So they are just basically unemployed right now. They are, they are struggling mightily. And those forgotten heroes should not be discarded by us, uh, the, the, the union, the administration, or their communities. This is wrong. And, and, and it's okay. We all make mistakes. Heck, my first three wives, disasters. But I'm just kidding. Married once, 49 years, still happily married. <laughs> um, and she's not in the room either. So, but, but you know, we've all made, we've all made mistakes. And, and some of them pretty significant. You know, I have. And, and hopefully I've hopefully I've righted them, atoned for it, apologized, you know, and I'll, and I'll continue to. I'm not I'm not always right. No one is. And that's OK. You know, but right now, to Tom's point, this is all about power and control. It's got nothing to do with public health. I'll, I'll turn it back over to our bosses. OK, so I'm going to go to PJ and then we'll go to Steve. But first, I just want to say, with all due respect, especially being in the political world that I am in now, the nonpartisan policy world. Um, we were taught one thing really quick. When somebody puts something to committee, a task force, or says we're coming on later, it just goes there to die. And I love being proved wrong. 
Uh, the president of the International Association of Firefighters, Ed Kelly, has told us before the election he was coming on the show. He is welcome on the show at any time. He will be treated with respect. I will even give him my questions beforehand so he can feel completely comfortable and be prepared to answer them. But there's no place to hide on politics and tactics. We need to be able to ask the hard questions. Now, I'll go back to Alan Brunacini. You know, it's easy to fool the players, but you can't fool. I'm sorry. It's easy to fool the spectators, but you can't fool the players. I was a union president and I represented deplorable people who beat their wives, DWIs, everything that you can possibly imagine because they paid dues. I had to invoke my inner John Adams and I knew that it was about protecting the process and that was my fiduciary duty. And what I've seen the international firefighters do is I've seen them give spe speeches, run for car service and go out to lunch and dinner. When I could give one so solution, the international fire service, the IFF, and Harold Shakespeare did this at one time, and everybody knows I'm not a big Harold fan, but Harold showed leadership once, and when the Democrats were going against his members, he said, PAC funding stops. Well, firefighters are being terminated, and they're being terminated based off what we know now is a lie, and if we thought it was the truth at one time, we all know now it was a lie. Now, cut off PAC funding until these firefighters are brought forth, but they won't do it because we're 14 days out of a midterm. So I'll get off my soapbox. PJ, and then we'll go to Steve. Sorry, Bob. Uh, I love you. And this will probably be my last show. <laughs> no, no, it won't. And full disclosure, uh, Eddie did join with us, Tom, down in, in uh, I, I believe we're, we're at Metro Tech. Brook, we're right down in Brooklyn. Are, are, are we aware of that? Yeah. A Eddie, Eddie did show up and he spoke. We were there. And, well, and uh, Can I just make a point about the unions and, 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 Obviously, the IAFF, the UFOA, the UFA, all the unions, I guess they could have done more. That's a big discussion I have with a lot of my peers. I get it. Guess who could have did more? I could have done more. We could all have done more. So I'm, not, I'm not holding everybody to that level that they could have done more. I, I, I happen to be a battalion chief, and I, and I look at, I don't always look to the union to fix the problems within an agency. I look for the leadership, the in-house leadership. So they're the ones that I'm, I'm holding more at, at a high level of accountability. Yeah, the union could have done more, but then again, so can I. So we, we, we all could have. And I'll leave you with this because I know you got to get to Steve in regards to one of your points before, Bobby, in regards to that, when is it a national emergency? New York City was able to survive an attack in, 19, in 2001. 3,000 Americans were killed on that day. We survived it. The city survived it, and then it flourished afterwards. We can't survive a man-made virus from Wuhan, China? Something ain't right. I don't want to take up Steve's time. PJ, go ahead. Yes, yeah, so the only thing I want to inter interject is uh, Tommy made an, uh, a statement regarding the uniform personnel and showing leadership and fighting for their men. And you have greater friendships and more friendships than I have with a lot of the, a lot of those current uniform members. I just want to make sure that everybody here understands that from a state perspective now, I'm seeing a whole different world, and I don't have patience that's needed sometimes at this level. Everything moves very, very slow. So while at times it will appear that the support may not be there or the uniform personnel may not be doing everything possible. But like you also said, there's the civilians making those decisions. And what I'm seeing now at, at this level is, man, those decisions just don't come fast enough for us. So I just wanted to throw that out there. So and I know that's not what you meant. There's nobody on this show but that would have those feelings that we know our uniform personnel is working for us, but unfortunately it's just not fast enough. I'm, I'm the wrong guy to ask because I don't necessarily disagree with you. You'd have to ask the people that were terminating, not me. They're the ones that need to be asked that, that, that inquiry. If you don't make an issue of things, you're not an issue. We needed our fire department leadership and the unions to equally, this was a time they could have stood hand in hand and made a positive impact. If, Remember, when you're terminated, it is the equivalent of the employment death penalty, where we put out all stops because we don't ever want to make a mistake. We asked our brother and sister firefighters to go to work in the pandemic when we didn't have all the knowledge. We said it's OK for them to get sick. We told them it was OK to bring it home to their families because it couldn't have been avoided. Um, our union stepped up and we made sure that they had housing in the initial at Yale. Yale University, we bullied Yale into 
allowing us to use dorms to quarantine firefighters because they didn't want to when firefighters were exposed to work. And we gave firefighters in New Haven the option to go live at a dorm, even if they didn't contract it. So they could have done better. Steve, welcome to Politics and Tactics. Uh, and before, and before Steve goes real quickly, my dog wanted to point out that when they wanted to, uh, well, my dogs wanted to point out when they wanted this mandate, they moved pretty damn quickly. That's right. That's exactly right. Go ahead, Steve. She okay. Even, uh, okay, Mr. Norwood, with all due respect, I, I, uh, Tom took my, uh, I mean, excuse me, he took my, uh, my thunder, but I was going to say that they didn't have any problem moving quickly to fire people. And, and, and you know, we want to we want to we wanna equivocate between unions and the city. Well, we don't have a union in the city of Seattle. Kenny Stewart, put Kenny Stewart on your show. I'll fly anywhere in America on my own dime. I'll talk to Ed Kelly. I'll talk to uh, Kenny Stewart. Bring him on with me because they didn't do anything. It's not that they didn't do enough. They didn't do anything. They only started to negotiate with the city after we were fired. They started negotiating for money for people who took the shot. They started negotiating for time off for people who, who did this and that. This is, this is not okay. This, the, this mandate moved at the speed of light to get rid of people who were not, not compliant. So, so if it can move at the speed of light to fire people, it can move at the speed of light to, to fix it. I'm sorry, I don't accept that. I've got a lot to say. Um, you talk about leadership. The West Coast has no fire leadership. We have politicians. Uh, Harold, uh, Harold Scoggins, fire chief for the city of Seattle. He, he came from California. He, he wanted this mandate. He is the, uh, the president of the King County Fire Chiefs Association. We have the King County Fire Chiefs Association meeting minutes where he lobbied and pressured other King County Fire Department to not accommodate people. Okay, we've all been granted religious exemptions. We've been denied religious accommodations. We could mask, we could, we could test, we could do all of that stuff for uh, a year and a half before, before the 18th of October of 2021, which is when our mandate kicked in. And, uh, uh, and that was all fine, but magically on the 19th, none of that was any good anymore. And the only thing that Harold Scoggins says is, well, the rules have changed because he 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 backs into he backs into his uh, political well, well the orders of the orders of the governor the orders of Jenny Durkin then governor of the city of Seattle and now uh, and now um, the current governor this is a mess they're going to lose but they're going just like the city of New York they lost in court but they're going to appeal it. And they're going to drag this out because they've got the dollars. Excellent. So we, we have an organization that we're putting together. It's called SeattleForFreedom.com. It's still under the inception. It's still a work in progress. But we've got emails, SeattleForFreedom at gmail.com. I hope people, like-minded individuals, contact us because, because there's a lot we need support. There's very few attorneys on the West Coast that are willing to risk their, uh, their necks in order to help us. We, we have we, we lack funding. We lack we, we lack the attorneys. We have a good attorney. His name's Nathan Arnold. Um, and believe me, we will win. It's just a matter of how much time it takes. And the midterms are staring these people down, staring down their their faces. So. Steve, how many Seattle firefighters lost their job? If, if 70, 70 of them. 65 to 75, somewhere in that neighborhood, because like myself, they, they don't count me as fired. Because we have what's called a louder mill hearing, which is a constitutional thing for public employees. So you go to your louder mill hearing and they said, well, your last day for me was June 15th because I had had COVID. I had COVID in, uh, um, in September. And then I had long, co long COVID and I was under a doctor's treatment up until March. Then it took them until June 15th to actually fire me after they said, well, that your last day is June 15th. It could be processed as being fired, which means I lose my sick time and all of the other stuff, the benefits that I had accrued, or I could retire. So I said, well, of course, I, wa I want to retire. Uh, and so, so yeah, I, I, th th this is just so wrong. And, and it's, I don't mean to diminish anyone in America's issues. But I don't believe and I have not read anywhere where it's been as draconian as King County and the city of Seattle. 
There's not been one firefighter work one day, not one day since the 18th of October. But let me make a point to you. There, there was the ability, which I did not participate in, but there was the ability to get a fake vaccine card. How many firefighters in America have a fake vaccine card? Because what that means is there's people out there on the job right now who haven't been vaccinated, but nobody cares. I, I had COVID in the, in the month of October. And, uh, um, and then I, I entered into a study with, the, uh, uh, with one of the local hospitals here where uh, they tested your, uh, your uh, immunity levels. And when I went to my louder mill hearing on about the somewhere in the beginning of June, I presented the scientific information that I had natural immunity. There's 200 plus studies, peer reviewed studies, all these studies all over the world for people who have who have had COVID and recovered. And they say that there's a you have a 91 percent immunity if you've had COVID and recovered. The best immunity from vaccine is 83 percent. And that's the, if you get three shots of Moderna. Uh, Pfizer, by the way, is 67 67 uh, percent. I've got reams and reams of studies right here in front of me. This is not science. This is politics. And the leadership on the West Coast is political. The, the fire department leadership in the West Coast. And let me tell you, they had a meeting with a, where Adrian Thompson, who was the policy director for Jenny Durkin for the city of Seattle. Sorry, the details probably bore people. But Jenny Durkin's policy director, Adrian Thompson, directed directed a Zoom meeting. Guess what? You, can't, you cannot... Uh, uh, FOIA or public disclosure request a Zoom meeting. So all of their meetings are on Zoom. So you can't, you can't look them up and you can't FOIA them or public disclosure request. So, so Adrian Tom Thompson had a Zoom meeting where she directed all of the city HR members that they would not be granting accommod religious accommodations. Okay, and guess who, guess who knew about that meeting? Kenny Stewart, Local 27 president. He knew that we were not going to, that they were not going to uh, grant any religious accommodations. He knew that. Watched us all get fired. Hasn't done anything. The leadership of the, of, of local 27 is an arm of the city of Seattle. So uh, enough of my rant, my apologies to, <laughs> this will probably be my last show as well. No, <laughs> no, this is, this is what you this is what this Great. show is. It's okay I to have a this I show. Have it. it's, it's okay to I be have passionate this. on this show. I mean, the, fire engineering is the firefighter's journal. It's always been. And anybody who has the counter view, you're welcome to come on the show and you will be treated respectfully. I give you my, my word. And again, I'll give you the questions beforehand so that you can be prepared to have a cogent conversation. It's okay to debate. One of the main issues with this vaccine was there wasn't debate. It wasn't just that it wasn't approved through the legislature, these mandates. There was no legislative debate. There was no scrutiny. There was no back and forth. And we all know that there is value in dissenting views. It keeps us all accountable. It keeps us all honest, even when we disagree with those views. It's okay not to agree in America. But when we're paying dues to an organization to represent us, they have to pull out all stops because that's their job. We're talking about the career death penalty. So I have no sympathy for that. When we have fire chiefs, you know, you're a fire chief. You're a leader. You know, it's kind of like the Navy sailor. You know, it's not, you don't make your bones on comm seas. You're tested. You're, our fire chiefs shouldn't be politicians. They should be advocates regardless of political party. Great policy does not know any political party. I've seen some good policy from the Democrats. I've seen some good policy from the Republicans. But the fact is we have to look at it through a policy lens, not a partisan political lens. And our it's not too late for politicians to change course, and they simply have a crutch. Our understanding is better now. The unions, um, blown away that they didn't take the right stance to begin with, but they still have the ability now to say, okay, the science is proven that if you get the vaccine, you can still spread it. And in full disclosure, I'm vaccinated. I had a wife that was high risk, and I immediately got the vaccine when it, when it came out. And then I went to a conference and came back and got COVID and gave her COVID. Um, so 
I I will tell you right now, my wife don't even go to the grocery store. And here I was the one who gave her COVID and I was I fully vaccinated because I made that choice risk versus benefit for myself and my family. But each individual needs to make that choice. And it's not too late for any of our politicians, including the chief of Seattle, Seattle's union, the chief of New York City, the commissioner and the politicians to change course. You um, I think I'm going to try to remember it, but Anthony Avillo has a, a quote that I thought was good. And it said that leadership can't occupy the same uh, leadership and rank can't occupy the same space as ego. Sometimes we have to make decisions for the people we represent, even if we disagree with them. I mean, like I said, I represented people that drove drunk. I lost an aunt and an uncle by DWI, somebody driving drunk at two separate incidents. And I represented people who and did a good job for them. So we got to represent these individuals and we got to work to get their job back because these are middle class people working paycheck to paycheck. And it's very difficult to get a lawyer to take on this case. I mean, I know my Supreme Court case, you know, we were ready to put the house up. Things were looking really bad for a while before things finally changed. So the cost to the individual and the cost to the family is just unbelievable. Uh, Tom, I'm going to go to you. Was and ask you a question was, I saw your testimony before New York City City Hall, and I was impressed. Uh, you came out across as a consummate professional, uh, well-spoken, articulate, um, laid it all out. Was that your first time testifying before the city council? Because that's not something a normal rank firefighter or chief does, and that alone takes courage. I was born in the Bronx, raised in Staten Island, worked for the fire department for 38 years. That was the first time I was in City Hall. First time I was in City Hall. I was, I was impressed with the, uh, the city council leader who was leading that, that committee, although she came out recently and was in favor of the mandate. Uh, she was very professional at the meeting, but unfortunately, her, uh, her progressive views uh, are not in sync with, with ours. Um, but we're going back and forth here now, too. We're, we're going both. I mean, we're looking at, is it the union's fault? Is it the, is the leadership fault within the department? I guess we could put enough blame on, on everyone if we really wanted to, but this now, and, and everyone agrees, I think that it's purely political now. And is this has to be addressed in the courts and it has to be addressed in two weeks from now, approximately when, on election day, because that's, that's, that's how it's going to get rectified. What happens after the election? I don't know. Are they going to keep doubling down these, these uh, politicians who actually still believe that it, it works when obviously <laughs> we have all the uh, all the evidence that it, that it doesn't work. Um, this is a political hot potato. I've been telling everyone after a while, not health science, political science. And the more we get engaged too, and 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 I'm not one to. I never. I used to think that people went to rallies, marched over bridges, or whatever. They got nothing better to do. I've been over the Brooklyn Bridge four times. I've been over the Brooklyn Bridge four times. I'm speaking at the city council meeting. I got signs in front of my house. I never had lawn signs in front of my house endorsing politicians. You know, I was at, I spoke the other day at a rally and, and then about a half hour later, Lee Zeldin spoke. I mean, this is this is an impressive uh, man who understands the fight that we're in and, and, and the fight that we're up against. And I mean, obviously, if he wins the state state um, governorship, it doesn't control anything in New York City. That's going to be addressed in the courts. How, 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 how much the fire department legal division and how much New York City legal division wants to fight it and pursue it, I don't know. But I will tell you from a political perspective, and, and you know what, I, I, I really don't care. He, he did it publicly and he did it on his own. I won't mention his name, but the former commissioner, when the idea of mandates was being bantered about in New York City, we weren't sure if they were coming. And I knew what I was going to do immediately would be to retire. And I was blessed again that I could do that. He the former commissioner acknowledged that he was in favor of the mandates and they should be introduced by the mayor on the same day that the New York City Fire Department remembers its fallen members on Memorial Day. That was, that was a sad, sad commentary from a leader, purely political. I got something to say. Go ahead. Uh, first of all, people's lives are not politics. Mike Tillerman, Okay, I, I was a ladder truck driver, and for all you engine guys out there, the guy in the back that drives the back of the fire truck is called a tillerman. So, so um, my tillerman, 
was forced to take the vaccine. He, he was religiously, uh, he had a religious proclivity to take in the vaccine, but he had to weigh the, um, the, 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 uh, the risk. It was a risk benefit analysis. He had to take the chance that, uh, and, uh, uh, and violate his religious beliefs for his family. Okay. And, and that's not politics. Okay. I, I went to a funeral for a person that I've known for multiple decades and, uh, it's my personal bit opinion that he died of the vaccine. And they found him dead at home. He was 52 years old. Good man, great man. The fire department, he had recently retired and he, and in his words, he had retired because of the uh, uh, draconian mandates and the poor treatment of the Seattle firefighters by the administration. So I don't, I don't want to, God bless him, God rest his soul. So uh, I went there. Um, with my Santa Claus beard and the whole thing. Um, there was probably 700 people there and the fire department ran the, ran the future, the funeral or the memorial service. And they got up there and they talked about brotherhood. They talked about collective, you know, the collective good. And, uh, and that was pretty hard to hear. That was pretty hard to hear while 70, 65, it's 70 ish. I don't have the count at the end of my fingertips here, but there's, there's approximately 70 people 10 year experienced firefighters who've kicked doors in, dragged babies out of, out of houses that are no longer firefighters in the city of Seattle because they don't, they, they wanted to violate our religious freedoms. It, and, and so we can talk about politics. We can talk about the, the, the speed of city government. I put up, okay. The attorney required $2,000 retainer for each one of us. And there's about 25 of us on the, uh, on the lawsuit. There's, there's, I put up personally put up my own money for one of the, one of the people because they didn't have enough money to, to defend themselves legally in court. Okay. This gentleman has multiple children, a wife, he's a younger person and he got fired and the city just moved on. The firefighters in Seattle have moved on. They don't call you. Don't tell me about brotherhood. The, the, the America is listening to me right now. Brotherhood, not in Seattle. Our union knew what was going on. Our union let it happen. If they didn't help happen, help make it happen. Yeah, can I piggyback on that? And, and if you don't mind, I'm going to put on my, my, my tinfoil hat, all right? If, 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 if they can break a fire department, a fire department in Seattle, if you can get cops, firemen, EMTs, to obey and comply to something. And by the way, just so everyone knows, the fire department and, 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 and Mayor Adams is prideful that, that the New York City workforce is predominantly 90% vaccinated. But he fails to, neg to, to identify the fact that 40 to 50% of those people that are, that are vaccinated were coerced into being vaccinated. So that's, that's, that's coercion. So if you can get 50% to 75% or whatever percentage it is, to obey New York City firemen, Seattle firemen, cops and firemen, people that are on the front lines, you can get anybody in the country. Tom, be, before, Tom before I go to PJ to read, uh, somebody posted something on Facebook, I uh, just want to ask you a question. Didn't the mandate in the city change and now the mayor's office is allowing athletes to come into the city? Oh. Without vaccination, absolutely. Like firefighters are fired. Is that true? Excellent point. And 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 I it, we've I spoke about it the other day when I was in City Hall's rally. The mandate was consistent for anybody that worked in New York City, private employees and public employees. Initially, when the Yankees started doing well, hey, God bless Aaron Judge. God bless Aaron Judge. And, and how many of the Yankees? No, seriously, broke he broke Roger Maris's record. I don't know what his vaccination status is. I don't care, but. Baseball players, basketball players, football players were exempt. And then about a month or two ago, maybe a little longer, private employees were exempt. All employees in New York City, with the exception of public workers, are required, are not required any longer to be, to, to be vaccinated. I mean, they might have their own private companies mandates. That's, that's, that's something different. But New York City only requires public workers to be vaccinated. They they given they gave exemptions to the to the athletes and the entertainers. We've got to have Broadway up and running, uh, so they got their exemptions a few months ago. I'm not really exact, not really familiar with the exact timeline at this point. PJ, 
Yeah, so I'm just going to uh, throw this out there. I have to uh, bail off in a couple minutes for another meeting starting at 2 o'clock. I just want to hit a point from uh, Steve before piggyback on something uh, Frank said. Steve, you started off your comment report with no, no disrespect. I don't take any disrespect. I'm one of those guys that I'm okay having a dispute, having a debate, and I'm not one of those that – and I'm not saying I agree or disagree. I'm trying to protect myself a little bit today. However, even if I did disagree – I'm still okay to have that conversation. We can still be friends. I'm not one of those guys. And this show never is that, right? We appreciate the debates. This is like the kitchen table at the firehouse. But we have Frank Ritchie and, and Chief Halton doing the, the good uh, the good lawyer work that not the firehouse lawyers. Chief, and then I'm going to read this comment from Facebook. And, and to that point, um, this is politics and tactics. And unless people have the courage, the authenticity, and the honesty to come forward and present their position and their opinion, then then there is no such thing as democracy. Democracy is the freedom of everyone to express their opinion. And then we normally get to vote on it, which didn't happen here. The legislatures were never involved. This was a mandate from the executive branch of states, cities, federal government that was never ever allowed to be run by the, the public at large, which, which is the first point. Um, and then there's some points about the, the point that our good friend Rich Leach is going to, PJ is going to read. And I'd like to comment on that also. And again, this is politics and tactics. If you're listening and you disagree with it, let us know. We'd love to have you come on and say why you think mandates were valid and necessary. And, and you'll be more than welcome. And you'll be treated, as Frank said, with the utmost respect and courtesy. We're not saying, we're not, you know, and if you want to take the shot, take the shot. Frank took the shot. You know, good, good for Frank. You know, I didn't, Steve and, and Tom didn't, good for us. It, you know, just we're not saying that, 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 that you shouldn't have had the right to take the shot. What we're saying is, is that you should have had the right not to take the shot. Okay. And, and I call it the shot because it's not a vaccine. They changed the definition of vaccines and then they're fudging numbers to say that it has some kind of therapeutic effect. But that is also not completely true, and, and it has not been validated. It has not. There's no empirical evidence that it does anything. And, and disclaimer, you know, Frank, I know you're aware, and Chief Fulton, you're aware. I, I took the shot as well um, because when when it first started, uh, my wife was immunosuppressed, and her oncologist told me listen, you can't be near her. So I lived in a camper that was donated to me in my driveway for eight weeks. So looking at it from at that point for me, the decision that was the best thing for my wife, whether it was good for me or not, I'm not sure, but it got me out of the, the best man cave that I ever actually had and back into the house. So well, uh, and for full disclosure, I had cancer. I have an autoimmune disease. I have cancer now and I still wouldn't take the shot. So, so read this. everybody's different and everybody has a right to decide what level of risk they're willing to accept. Why don't we read uh, Rich's deal yeah. here? There's a couple of points that I think we need to talk about. So I'm going to read the whole thing, then you guys can break it down because I do have to bail in a couple minutes. Uh, so this is right from uh, Rich Leach on Facebook, like was mentioned. Playing devil's advocate. What's the difference between mandating our kids to get vaccinated to attend school versus being mandated to, uh, mandated to be vaccinated to go to work? The end goal is to decrease the mortality rate, which the vaccine had done. I do agree that we should not terminate for people for not being vaccinated. But what is the solution to protect the membership and the public? Okay, so the question is built off a faulty premise. And let me just quickly explain why. Because it talks about the mortality rate. We're talking about kids and the mortality rate for kids is almost non-existent. So the fact of the matter is, it's not, again, it's off that faulty premise that the vaccine is going to stop transmission. Even Pfizer has admitted now it, it doesn't stop transmission. So the fact of the matter is, our, I would not have my kid vaccinated to go to school. And I actually recommended my granddaughter don't get vaccinated to go to school. They're not at a high risk group. We could argue over whether it reduces the severity. And I still think that there's studies that are undergoing on that issue. But also we know that COVID actually morphed and changed into something else. So the studies, is COVID less lethal now? Is it because of the vaccine or is it because it changed 
into and it mutated into a different, I am not a biologist, but a different form of COVID. So uh, I think the, the jury's still out on all that, but I don't really think there's a difference. It shouldn't be compelled. Parents should make the decision. Bobby. And, and again, to, to Rich's point, and thank you, Rich. And he, Rich made it very clear he's not in favor of terminating people for not getting it. But the problem becomes this was an emergency use authorization. It, there was very little data for it. It was predicated on faulty math from a, a British scientist who thought we were going to lose like 7 million people. That didn't happen. We have a flu season here every year that kills in a bad year. I believe it's like 65,000 people when we have a bad flu. And, and even flu shots which are shots, not vaccines, tend to morph and change. And sometimes the flu shot's completely useless because the, vac- the, the virus has changed. This is a virus which was constantly changing. There's no evidence at this point that I'm aware of or have been informed of that shows that this has done anything to lower the mortality rate. The mortality rate was basically the evolution of the virus and, and, and herd immunity and, and many, many other uh, contributing factors. Now, if, if, if you want to take the if you if you want to take the shot and you feel it's giving you something, some some protection, good for you. Um, but in terms of protecting the public and the membership, um, you know that that that's a that's a that that's a every other every other vaccination has got years years of study and research behind it. Years. This had none of that. None of that. Steve. Yeah. Let's talk about some facts. Before, before there was any, any vaccine at all, um, there was a 98.6% uh, percent survival rate. And the, and the 1.4% that did die of it, were most of them were in excess of 80 years old. The, uh, the average lifespan in the United States is 72 or 73. I, I didn't know I was going to talk about this. But, but the point being is that the people who got, got COVID back before there was a vaccine the, the majority of them were in excess of 81, 80 years old that who, who perished from the disease. Did they perish from the disease? Did they perish because they were old? I personally sent a gentleman to the hospital with a gunshot wound who died. He died of a gunshot wound. They listed him as a COVID death. Those, those stats are baloney. Okay, if you died with COVID, they listed you of, as dying of COVID. This is all a political push. Okay. And then uh, this gentleman said, uh, you have to get vaccinated to attend school. That's not the, that's not the law The you have to get vaccinated and tend to attend school unless you have a religious reason for not doing so. Okay. And they just added the COVID vaccine for children uh, to attend school to the, uh, uh, to the childhood vaccine schedule. That is a recommendation. That is not a mandate. The other thing about that is, is that the, is the political reason that they, they added it to the childhood vaccine schedule is, is to, there's a law where uh, the, the, uh, the manufacturers of the, uh, of the vaccine or the, or the shot get, get uh, protection from being sued if they get added to the childhood vaccine schedule. So, there's no there's there's no mystery as to why it's happening on October 20 whatever October 20 whatever before the midterm elections because Pfizer wants that protection from being sued. That's the way this is. Okay, and, and you know the I'll, I'll I'll leave it there for the time being. Can I? The one thing that I, I'd like to see, in all honesty, what I'd like in society there are some norms, and every time you watch TV, you have another pharmaceutical company pushing a medication. But when they're showing you the kid running around with the balloon, they always tell you what the side effects are. But yet these are the vaccines that aren't there. So what I really like our political class to do is put on that commercial that has the same requirement as the other vaccines and tell us what you're not telling us. And that's just something- They don't have have to do that. I I, I, I will. Let me, uh, Steve made a great point about the indemnification for the, for the uh, pharmaceuticals. That's exactly where they wanted it in the children's schedule. Right on, sir. But I didn't realize this until recently, too. Medications, pharmaceuticals, were never allowed to have commercials on TV. Who's paying the price for the, the silence of the media? The pharmaceutical companies. We don't hear it from them because they're paying the price. Every other commercial is a pharmaceutical commercial. That was illegal years ago. So there's no way anybody 
CNN, Fox, any of those major broadcasting companies are going to go after the pharmaceuticals. You have a few people in the media, Tucker Carlson, that might take on the pharmaceuticals. God bless him. But I just want to, I know we're getting towards the end. Get used to this new term, especially in New York City. Oh, by the way, in regards to that Englishman with the statistics, Bobby, that came out with that, that, that model of how many men and women would die from this disease. And, and I'm, not, I'm not being a moral judge of his character yet. I'm, that's not my point here. But if, if I'm not mistaken, he got caught having, having get- sex with his buddy's wife while he was contaminated. Yeah, he left. So obviously he didn't buy into his own statistics, right? So he didn't buy into his own. Again, I'm not being judgmental of his, his relationship with the woman. He'll have to deal with the almighty then. Seneca I was a big fan of Seneca. He used to have sex with his buddy's wives too. They didn't like him either. But <laughs> you know, not passing problem. judgment. Me- medical, Seneca was medical a fire. Episode. Medical let, episode. Let me, let me read this one from Charlie, Charlie Brown from Facebook. He said, we shouldn't be mandating children to be vaccinated either. The vaccine didn't play a part in decreasing mortality, but decreased mortality rate was the mutation of the virus, less lethal variants. COVID-19 was far worse for those who were in poor health and society have been plummeting in terms of overall health. This virus brought that to the forefront. And the fire service as a reflection of society should not be exempt from that. The virus should be an absolute wake up call for us as a society and for us as the fire service that we need to focus on improving our health in total in order to be able to fight off the disease. Great comment. I disagree with any of that. Right. And, and, and thank you to everybody who's watching us on Facebook. We sure do appreciate it. And, and we're going to go a little long because I, I want to hear more from Steve and Tom and, and I pay the bills so I can do that. As long as Frank, you can stay with us for a little bit longer. I can um, stay for a couple minutes longer. And, uh, and again, I just want to put out there, if you have an opposing view, this is an opinion show. This is politics and tactics. This is the show. I get the emails all the time and on Twitter, direct messages. Uh, why don't you stick to the fire service, not politics? This is politics and tactics. Yes. So it's okay to come on and discuss no, no, your- The title of the show is politics, for God's sake. <laughs> if you want to hear a tactic show, go to our tactic. We have a tactic show that, that airs on another Wednesday. Okay. So um, it, 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 uh, I had a thought really quick I was going to share, but go, go ahead, uh, Steve or Tom. Uh, yeah. or I just wanna, uh, let me just skip, see one thing I, before I forget. Medical episodes. You talked about a young fireman, 52 years old. We've had younger firemen in the, med- in the fire academy, young guy, one guy sh- scrapping you 32 year old men. These men are dying of medical episodes. What, 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 what does that mean? A medical episode, two or three young firemen under 40 years old. And they just dropping dead. Nobody's discussing that. I mean, nobody's discussing that at all. That's that's the elephant in the room that nobody wants to discuss. 28 years in the fire service, 28 years I've had. I, and I look back over my 28 years in the fire service. I don't remember one single person dying of an unexplained event, not one in 28 years, old men, young men. I, I, and, and since, and since in the last two years, there's been, there've been new num- numerous. Okay. So the only person I can think of dying at, at, you know, with an unexplained cause other than I, 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 there aren't any, there just aren't any. And now all of a sudden it's called sudden adult death syndrome. It's so common. We have a name for it. Now, let me let me make another point about the vaccine mandate in in the state of Washington. The state of Washington is a very diverse place. If you haven't been here. okay, there's the West Coast. We call it the wet side. That's where the the water it rains, the east east side. Every all the politics in the entire state of state of Washington are directed around the city of Seattle. They've got all the young, you know, pie in the sky voters. uh, You know, uh, this is the home of Antifa. And by the way, there's Seattle firefighters who marched with Antifa. If that isn't a little bit sad to defund the police and all of that sort of thing. So the city of Tacoma and the city of Seattle are, are you know, 40 miles apart, 35 miles apart. The, the King County fired every single person, every single firefighter who did not get the shot. OK, wouldn't let them work on the rigs. The city of Tacoma accommodated every every uh, person who had a religious exemption. City of Tacoma has not died of COVID. So, so that it's a, it's a dichotomy. It's a, it's an absolute opposition. Why does the city of Seattle have to fire me or have to fire uh, people with 15 years in the fire service who have, haven't gotten their pension yet, who, who have young families who are, who are now they're eating top ramen, losing their house. Okay. 
There's no reason for it. The good news of that is, is that the other localities the around here have started to go, hey, these guys are available. They've all spent time in Seattle, five years, 10 years, 15 years in Seattle, and they've all fought fire because the city of Seattle used to be called the Emerald City. It's now the poop city. We got homeless people defecating on Three Avenue. We, it, it, you get stuck with a needle when you go in the public restroom. This, this Seattle has, has turned into a, a, a you know, a, a dark place. And it's because of the leadership and the people like Harold Scoggins and, uh, 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 you know, the, the, the chief of the fire department, the Diaz, the chief of the police department. You know, the, you want to know who has it worse than we do? The police department in Seattle. You've heard the term defund the police. Well, they did it in Seattle. And then we've got city council members, Shama Sawant, who, who threw a fit because somebody threw a bag of human feces over her fence into her gated yard. She wants the police to investigate it. So it, it, this, is, this is ugly. Come to Seattle. You won't believe it. You won't believe it. Go to any inner city and you won't believe it. We, um, I'm at the witching hour for myself. Um, so I'm going to go around the horn and give everybody their their last word for the day. Again, welcome and uh, thanks. You guys were both great guests on Politics and Tactics. I'll start with Tom, move to Bobby, and I'll finish with Steve. Uh, and, and I know Steve's uh, looking Steve's looking to, to, to form some type of a political action committee. Yeah, unfortunately, life should not be thought of as a political activity. But unfortunately, to win this, we need to win it in the political realm. Uh, Bravest for Choice, you might want to reach out to Bravest for Choice to help you structure their, uh, structure your program out in the, on, on the West Coast. They, they reached out to city council people, uh, um, Vicky Palladino and Joan Ariola, the city council members of New York City have introduced legislation to get rid of these mandates. They are big advocates for us. So political action is necessary. And then also at a national level, Bravest for Choice has partnered with um, the National Coalition of Frontline Workers. Basically, a, a, an organization that's just going to look out after the, uh, the political interest of the whole organization, um, not union uh, shaped in the union perspective, and it doesn't supplant the union's efforts. If anything, it complements them. So they are starting to develop a program. We just had a referendum in here in New York State. Everybody that belonged to that program, we all voted internally, and National Coalition for um, Frontline Workers came out and they endorsed. Lee Zeldin for the uh, governorship of New York. So yes, political activity is quite necessary if we want to fight this. Um, and it's way bigger than the mandates. Again, I'll, yeah, I'll, my tin, I'll put my tinfoil hat on and, and, and we can discuss that. But we need to fight it in the political realm. It cannot be fought without the political uh, action and without legislative assistance as well. And so with that, thank you all. A phenomenal opportunity. Thank you all. Make sure everybody votes in the midterm. I'm going to let Bobby close out at the end because he shouldn't be the grand finale. So I will go to Steve for your last word and then we'll go to Bobby Hall. Uh, like, uh, like Tom said, and God bless you, Tom. Um, we, uh, we have, a, we are attempting to set up an organization. Uh, we have a Seattle for freedom.com S E A T T L E number four freedom.com. Uh, there will be, there will be information being posted on that website soon. You can, you, you can reach us via email there. Um, anybody who wants to assist, it, this is not going to be an easy fight. This is not something that, that uh, as an example, the gentleman, uh, uh, Ravisi, uh, in, in New York, um, you know, he won hands down going away. And now they're, now they are, uh, they're appealing it because they've got the citizens money to do that. It's the same thing in Seattle. The only, it's sad. It is sad, but the only thing that's going to fight this is money and lawyers. Lawyers cost money. <laughs> and lawyers and so, cost so, money. so it's you know. America money, guns, <laughs> and lawyers, Bobby. And look, look, Warren Zevon to end out the show. Get him singing. Little Warren Zevon. Send lawyers, guns, and money. Lawyers, the guns, poop, and money. The poop has hit the fan. <laughs> so, yeah, right? Werewolves of London. Great, great, great artist. Yeah, yeah. The, <laughs> the two, two things to close, to, to put this in perspective. No one on this call is um, diminishing the incredibly devastating and um, brutally 
uh, horrible effects of uh, the Wuhan virus and COVID, whatever you want to call it. I prefer to call it the Wuhan virus. No, no one is, no one is uh, diminishing that it was horrible. I lost three great friends, wonderful friends, by the way, all of whom were fully vaccinated. And so they, I get it. It, it was gut wrenching. What, one of my buddies got sick at about six o'clock at night at two o'clock in the morning, he was dead. And so absolutely brutal, unpredictable, terrible virus. We get that. We also get that this great nation was predicated first and foremost on the rights and freedoms of the individual. And if we encroach on the rights and freedoms of the individual, even slightly, then we have no American dream. Now, that's not to say that we don't do things as groups for the benefit of the country, for our communities. Obviously, we're firefighters. We get that. We take inordinate risk for the benefit of our communities and our fellow citizens. But at the same token, when our inaction or action affects literally no one but ourselves, then that should be respected. And there was zero evidence that this treatment provided any kind of immunity or protection or lack of transferability whatsoever. In fact, just the opposite is now glaringly apparent. Um, I think in years to come, this will be studied, hopefully, honestly, and openly and transparently, um, and, and, and we'll, we'll have more understanding of it. But all that the people on this call today are saying is that the individuals who chose not to participate in an experimental treatment for this virus should be respected and their choices should be respected. And it wasn't that they meant to do any harm because they knew early on, we knew early on that this virus was um, highly transmittable and, it, and nothing short of totally isolating someone was going to protect them. And even then eventually you have to come out and now it's everywhere and it will be everywhere forever because it's a virus. So what we are saying is that, and Carl Sagan said it best, he said, when, and I'm paraphrasing, but he said, when people have been, boot, been bamboozled or, or you know, fooled by evidence that was found later to be wrong, it, let's put it that way. But in other words, when we accepted assumptions and they were incorrect, we're, we're very reluctant to admit that because we're, admitting that means that we somehow miss our trust. We, we mis misplaced our trust. We were we gave up some of our uh, autonomy, our authority, with, without thinking it all the way through. And and maybe we did some of that in this case, and and that's okay. But to, to Sagan's point, the people who are still refusing to look at the data honestly and 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 openly, uh, that's just unconscionable at this point. And we need to have that conversation as a nation. And, and the one final point, remember, it's not just us. Uh, I have a family member who now has myocarditis. He's a 35 year, 36 year old man, perfectly healthy, perfect, perfect specimen, now has myocarditis. We also need to remember that our military was tremendously affected by this. The, 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 the Coast Guard diver who was praised on TV one day was actually fired three days later for not taking the treatment. Amazing as that is, but, you know, the very same people who were lauding him for his courage and bravery, let him go. He was good enough to risk his life during the hurricane, but, you know, he wouldn't take the shot. So we had to let him go. And, and, and God bless him because he's speaking out openly about it. And, and I think it's just at this point, it, it, it lacks credibility, in my opinion. And so I, we don't mean to offend anybody who's pro, pro you know, vaccine, good for you. You're welcome to come on, talk about it. We'll, we'll respect you. We'll listen to your points. But at this, you know, uh, we have, we have Tom who's considered one of the foremost leading authorities on high rise firefighting for the city of New York. And, that, and that's no small feat to gain that level of stature. Um, among his peers, he's considered to be a man you'd want your children to grow up to be like. And his authenticity and his honesty and his uh, life of service and is just unquestioned. Steve is the same way. Among the Seattle firefighters I know, um, just a man of unquestionable character. And we should say that there was a firefighter in the Seattle area who opposed the vaccine vehemently, who finally capitulated, 
and then several days or weeks later lost his life to suicide and that's a story that was relayed to me by several seattle firefighters and they they believe that he felt he compromised himself to the point where he couldn't live with himself anymore so that's something we need to think about too when you compulse somebody to do something when you force them to do something at the point of them losing their livelihood losing their ability to take care of their children and their family, you better be damn sure that what you're doing is the right thing to do because the consequences can be fatal. And so thank you to Frank Ritchie and PJ Norwood for having the courage to bring this topic up. Thank you to Steve and Tom for being willing to come on a public airway and, and make your opinion known. Thank you to everybody who agrees and everybody who disagrees. That's what America's about, the respectful exchange of ideas and then the respectful compromise or common ground that we're all Americans. We've all been blessed to live in the greatest country in the face of the planet. We've all been given God-given, God-given natural rights that we need to protect and defend at all costs. And every person on this call has proven that they're willing to do so. So thank you to all who joined with us. Thank you uh, to my bosses for giving us this platform and for having the courage to allow us to speak our minds freely and openly. And if anyone disagrees, please reach out to me and we'll schedule you to be on the show and, and you can have your opinions heard. So thank you all. Thank you, Chief. Thank you, Chief.